Hi, my name is Ragni Liuslan. I'm from the University of the Highlands and Islands Archaeology Institute. And in this talk, I'm going to investigate a figure called the Muckle Black Wallowa. Who or what was the Wallowa conceived to be among the early modern population of the Orkney Islands? My first encounter with the Muckle Black Wallowa was in a text by the Victorian self-taught folklorist Walter Trail Denison from the island of Sandy in Orkney. He's been criticised for embellishing his accounts and this verse may be an example of that, but I nonetheless believe that there's a kernel here of genuine folk belief and tradition. Denison gives an account of a ritual to give yourself up to the devil and in return get magical powers from him to become a witch and says he heard this from the granddaughter of a noted witch. You must go to the shore at midnight, turn three times anti-sunwise and then lie down with your head to the south between the high and low tide marks. Grasp a stone in either hand, a stone by each foot, a stone by your head, a stone on your chest and over your heart seven in total. Lie with arms and legs stretched out, shut your eyes and say this spell. Afterwards lie quietly for a little while. As you open your eyes, turn onto your left side, rise up and fling the seven stones into the sea one by one. And the spell is, O Messer King, O Ah that's ill, come fill me with a warlock skill and I shall serve with all my will. Trow talk me gonna sinna, trow talk me gonna winna, trow talk me when I kinna. Come talk me nu and talk me ah, talk lights and liver, pluck and ga, talk me, talk me nu, I say, for the how of the head to the tip of the tail. Talk ah that's out and in me, talk hair and hide and ah to thee, talk heart and hands, flesh, blood and bends. Tag a atween the seven stands in the name of the muckle black wallowa. And it's the bottom line that interests me. Who is this muckle black wallowa? Immediately one thinks of the devil. That is his an alternative name for the devil himself. But after having had a closer look and I think I've come to a different conclusion. And what I want to do in this talk is to argue the case that the Wallowa was not originally the devil, although by the 1880s, when this was written, it seems to have been understood as such. The ritual of lying down between high and low tide marks is also attested from Shetland by Edmonston and Saxby, also in the 1880s, with a similar spell, saying, the muckle master deal talk what atween this twa horns, laying one hand under the soles of her feet and the other on her head. So the devil was then supposed to appear and shake hands on the deal. And we notice that in that version of the spell, the devil is mentioned by that name. His appearance as a menacing black figure is also typical of descriptions of the devil in court records from the witchcraft trials between the 1560s and 1730s the devil is sometimes described as a black man or a man in black clothes an example is the famous north berwick trials in 1590 to 91 where we hear of a vivid description of a black mass led by the devil who stands in the pulpit surrounded by black candles and he's said there to look like a meekle black man. So I have no doubt that the Wallowa was thought of by Denison and his contemporaries as the devil. But I also believe that the name Wallowa only came to denote the devil quite late and that it had an earlier history of denoting something else, which I'll now try to show. I think part of the confusion comes from conflating two words that have over time come to sound the same. On the one hand, we have the old English well away as an exclamation of sorrow. 
we see this usage attested in Scotland, for example, in this rhyme from 1678. Farewell, Galloway, for I will never come back to thee again. Thou art now Galloway, but thou wilt become a Walloway. But on the other hand, there seems to be a specific Northern Isles usage, as we can see in this Shetland example from 1879. What ill Wallava is sent thee this way? John Jameson, in his Etymological Dictionary of the Scottish Language, tries to reconcile the two by saying that Wallowa can mean the devil nominated as a personification of the sorrow. But I disagree. I think what we're seeing in Northern Shetland is something else. By the 1880s, the Northern Isles Wallowa has come to be seen as the devil, but to find its roots, we have to go further back in time. And to do that, I want to go a detour via a witchcraft trial from 1629. The trial of Jonet Rendell for witchcraft. Jonet Rendell's story. Jonet was tried in 1629. She was a poor woman, homeless, begging for her food. At this time, people believed in the fairies. The hill folk, they were called, and had an uncanny power. Twenty years ago, like you have said, John went up the Rendell Hills to meet a fairy she called the Wally Man. He was dressed in white, with a white head and a grey beard. He taught Jonet how to heal, so she could help people, but also to harm and cast illness on those who refused her food, on a, or a bed for the night. She could take the fat out of milk, steal the profit as they said. No, said Jonet. Wally Man did it. Wally Man is no fairy, said the accusers. Wally Man is the devil. In her trial record, it says that Jonet Rendell is supposed to have met with a figure who gave her the power to heal and to harm by witchcraft. She was poor, she lived by donations. And after entering a pact with this figure, she had the power to help those who gave her food and lodgings, but also to harm those who refused her. The accusers claim that Jonet's meeting with the figure happened on a hilltop in her home parish of Rendell. We also hear that Jonet's description of him. He was dressed in white clothes with a white hat and had a grey beard. The accusers are certain that this was the devil, but Jonet herself is not so sure. She calls him by the name of Wally Man. I must acknowledge here the research of Ashley Angus, who's pointed out that there's a disjunction between the voices of the accusers and the voice of Jonet herself. They seem to have different ideas of who Wally Man is, and Jonet does not seem to think that Wally Man is the devil. Later in her trial, Jonet says that there's neither man nor beast sick that's not taken away by the hand of God. But in return for charity, she's able to cure by praying to Wallerman. So who is Wallerman to Jonet? So going back to Denison's Wallowa again. The 20th century folklorist Ernest Marwick suggested that the Norse figure of the Volva may lay behind the Wallowa. Um, it's not a bad suggestion and he may well be correct. The word is closer to the Shetland form though, Wallowa. Ernest Marwick glossed Wallowa as witch. But as you know, the Volva is a very specific type of magic worker who figures in Old Norse literature and has been recognised archaeologically by her Voller 
her staff, a magic wand that we see an example of at the bottom here. Um, a decorated metal rod that's sometimes found in high status female burials. A well-known example is the Klinta burial from the island of Öland in Sweden, shown here as an artist's impression. There are some obvious differences between the Volva and the Volva. While Jonet's Volvan is clearly male and also Denison's Volva, the Volva is always, film, always female. There's no mention of a staff in connection with the Volva or Volvan. Also, the Volva is human, not supernatural. There's a literary tradition of waking dead Waller in their graves, though in an old Norse poem, Grugalder, a dead Volva named Grua is called from her burial mound. And in Baldur's Draumar, Baldur's Dreams, Odin himself wakes a Volva from the dead. However, although dead, she's still conceived of as at least formerly human especially gifted human with magical skills and highly respected. In other Old Norse sources, we see living human Volur in action, notably Thorbjörg Little Volva from Greenland in the saga of Eric the Red. So was the Volva known in Orkney Shetland? difficult to know whether the Volva figure was known in Viking Age of Medieval Orkney and Shetland. There are yet no known staff burials from the area, however, the Norse population of the medieval earldom of Orkney, at least the elite, were familiar with saga literature and Eddic and Skaldic poetry where they would have encountered Volva. Whether she carried over to the early modern period is another question. There's one very interesting 19th century tale, though, that mentions a Volva. It was written down by George Marwick, who was born in 1836 on the west side of the Orkney mainland. He says he heard a tale from an old woman that he calls Mrs. Norn. The tale is a local version of the well-known Norse myth of Baldur's death and subsequent attempt to fetch him back from hell. The story follows the same main structure, but has many interesting deviations from its Icelandic counterpart. I can't go into the details now, but I will just note that the biggest deviation is that in this version, the rescue attempt is successful and Baldur is allowed to return to Orkney, where he becomes the forefather of a long line of Ballantines. During the rescue attempt, in both versions, the rescue party meet a female figure guarding the bridge Jallabru on the threshold to the realm of hell. Her name in the medieval Icelandic version by Snorri Sturluson is Molgudur, but in the Orkney version she's called Velja. She helps the rescuing party with good advice on how to get past the enormous dog that guards the hell's gate. It's been suggested by Terry Gunnell that Velja may be a vague memory of the Volva, whom Odin wakes in her grave in the Eric poem Baldur's Dreams, uh, preceding his death and the rescue mission. When Odin travels to hell to investigate why Baldur is having such bad dreams, the Volva in the poem is unnamed, just called Volva, so the name Velja would be a reflection of the common noun and the myths of Baldur's dreams and the subsequent death and rescue mission have been conflated in the Orkney version. Also, there's no indication in the Orkney version that Velia is a Volva. We don't hear her explained as such. She seems to have picked up her looks from hell herself, though. Coming finally now to my own theory, I believe that the Walua and the Waliman are the same figure and that this is an elf. By elf I don't mean an elf on the shelf but a, a fairy as elf was the standard word for fairy in English until fairy took over as a euphemism for elf. The Old Norse word was alvar or alvar plural alvar you get it with both long or short a. 
these were supernatural beings of great power and belief in them was standard in the medieval and early modern societies, both in Britain and Scandinavia. They could certainly cause disease or disaster, as the word elf shot, for example, attests. Unlike the Volva, elves were ubiquitous, they were everywhere, and also they were supernatural. Can the word Wallowa have derived from the Old Norse word Alvar? Well, at first glance, it doesn't f seem likely, but I think it can. 1629 was a time of cultural and linguistic transition in the Northern Isles. The local dialect of the Old Norse language, Norn, was in the process of being superseded by Scots, but there were still Norn speakers in the community. Also, many Norn words made their way into the Orkney Shetland varieties of Scots as dialect words. Norn place names carried on with adaptations in pronunciation and spelling. When you look at what happened with other Norn words and place names beginning with Al or Al, Jakob Jakobsen's etymological dictionary of the Norn language in Shetland gives several examples of Al or Al becoming Wall. For example, Alharder, Wallhard. Alka becomes Walki. Almenninger becomes Walman. Almugi becomes Walmer. And at the bottom here we have some place names. Well, it's actually just several attestations of so one place names. Walvul and variations on it, meaning Elf Hill. Alvar Hul. One of them is actually Wolver's Hul in Unst, Jesse Saxby's home. Um, it requires reading the first syllable of Wallowa with the same pronunciation as the English word wall, not Wallowa. But it should not be a problem, and at least no more of a problem than Marwick's or in Volva. Um, therefore, linguistically, Wallowa could be derived from Alver, although I'm not yet sure of the last syllable. And Walliman would therefore be an elf man. Let's look again at John Reynolds' description of the Walliman. He has white clothes, a white hat and grey beard, not the customary black of the devil. John's description is more like a traditional description of a fairy. For comparison, let's look at a story that was printed in the journal Old, Nor Old Lore Miscellary in 1911. It doesn't say where in Orkney this is, but it says in one of the best parishes where there is a number of old brochs description that fits very well for Rendell Parish. A farmer went out to dig one of these brochs mounds when a fairy figure appeared. I saw an old grey whiskered man dressed in an old grey tattered suit of clothes patched in every conceivable manner with an old bonnet in his hand and old shoes of horse or cowhide tied on with strips of skin on his feet. He addressed me as follows. Well, Mr. <coughs> They were working their own ruin. And then he says some more and then vanished. The fairy warns the man to stop digging or six of his cattle and six of his family members will die. And then he vanishes in thin air, just like Wally Man did. The story concludes by saying that every detail came true. Six cattle and six people did indeed die. This shows us not just how fairies were thought to look in Orkney, but also what powers they were thought to have. To compare to other witchcraft trials, I've picked the two best known witchcraft trials from Scotland, that of Isabel Gowdy in Nairn in 1662 and Angus Sampson at North Berwick in 1590 to 91. So Isabel Gowdy's trial shows us how she says the queen and king of the fairies look the queen of fairy is brawly clothed in white linens and in white and brown clothes etc and the king of fairy is a brown man well favored and broad-faced 
Um, Agnes Samson also talks of fairies, but I focus here on this passage from when she's attempting to find out whether a patient will survive or die. She goes out in the garden and calls on a spirit being. She passes to the garden to devise upon her prayer. One what time she charged the devil, calling him Elva to come and speak to her, who came in over the dike in the likeness of a dog. Um, and at the trial, Agnes also, like John, denies that the spirits that she calls are the devil, but the accusers are sure it is the devil. She calls him Elva, so I wonder if this is also an elf being, but now in the shape of a dog. Um, and I also noted that it has the same last syllable, ah, as the Waloa. Don't know if that's significant. In conclusion, I believe that the Waloa and Waliman are the same figure, uh, and that this figure reflects a folk belief in a male elf or fairy who can be called on to do magic. But the authorities and the learned elite in the 17th century equated him with the devil during the witchcraft trials. Um, so 250 years later, by Walter Trail Denison's time, the Wallowa's identity as the devil had been cemented and entered back into folk belief. Thank you very much.